Many Decatur High School students take city buses to and from school. But this year, police say some students' behavior has gotten out of control and is putting everyone who uses the service at risk. Our Paula Thornton has been investigating and joins us now from the studio. Paula, what do police think is causing the problems? Hey Sean, because of construction at Eisenhower High School, students are being bused up north to Stephen Decatur Middle School. That means roughly 300 more kids taking the bus than normal. Something deputies say has caused a surge of problems on the buses and at the transit center. As the time nears 345 each weekday. So at that time, with all the kids down here one time. Hundreds of kids get off city buses. When all the school buses come, it, it just becomes chaos. Sheriff's deputies are on hand to deal with all the students. Decatur police patrol the surrounding streets. We are, we are focusing on getting kids from one bus to another and making sure that they're not fighting. But many times, fights do happen. A lot of the kids are getting text messages that there's going to be a fight after school and it's going to be at the transit center. They're not the only problem, though. This year alone, deputies have made more than a dozen arrests, banned more than 45 kids from the center. Most of that for behavior problems, trespassing or loitering. There's an increase in number of kids that are actually on the buses. And with unruly kids on the bus, it can be a dangerous ride. So I'm concerned about not just my safety, but the safety of the other bus drivers. Clinton Dye is a bus driver who says he's reached his breaking point. You know, we really don't know what to expect at any given moment because it's just really a time bomb waiting to go off. He says one time he asked some students to get off his bus for breaking the rules. And one of the kids just walked around in front of the bus and just hit the window with a rock. An act deputy Jim Root says could endanger all riders. When you have kids in the back uh, throwing things, fighting, arguing, screaming and yelling, uh, those things are become distractions for the bus driver and make it a, a safety hazard for uh, not only them driving the bus, but every other kid that's actually on that service. To see what it's like, I rode two buses with the students. Moments after the buses were loaded, I immediately learned about a fight that was supposed to happen on the bus, but the girls waited until they got here to the transit center. Deputy Tim Hoffman tried to break it up, ordering them to get off the property. From across the street, they taunted him, even asking him to take off his badge and fight. So they feel like they can just do what they want to do with no repercussion. Something Di says needs to be fixed. It's really getting out of hand. Something needs to be done about it. Before an accident happens. Now deputies tell me the school district has been working with them on this issue. Principals have come down to the center and know of the problems there. And there have been some changes at the center that are helping. They've added some additional rides so that kids won't loiter at the center. And deputies are making sure that the kids get reloaded quickly onto those buses. Live in the studio, Paula Thornton, WAND News. Danger, it's a part of the job as an FBI special agent. As a member of the FBI Citizen Academy, our Paula Thornton got an inside look at snipers, bomb techs, and the use of deadly force. It looks real, but this is just an exercise. The Springfield Division FBI SWAT team showing us how they complete a mission. So we'll come in and, and hug the walls. I got to go inside as part of the Citizens Academy. The snipers shoot on the count of two. The ground team enters just a second later. They hit these soda bottles with ease at 104 yards. To qualify as snipers, they have to hit a golf ball 10 out of 10 times. Um, but it's a 10 power scope. I got to look down the scope of a sniper rifle to see what they see. You might want to use this as a fuse. For then we're off to learn about improvised explosive devices with the FBI bomb techs. They explain how to make explosives from everyday fuels and oxidizers. They start with small reactions. You know, first there's smoke and then, it, and then there'll be a flame in there. Building to bigger explosions. <laughs> loud enough to set off car alarms. And finally, the ring of fire. After the smoke clears, we head to the range. First comes instruction. This is the automatic weapon you'll be shooting today. Getting bullet points on each of the six guns we'll be shooting. Then it's my finger on the trigger. I wasn't so good at first. You almost hit the target. Almost. But the more I shot handguns, <laughs> an automatic, and you hit right in dead center. I know it's a lot. Even a shotgun. Make sure you rack it with authority. Good job. The better I got. 
Then it's back to the classroom to learn about the FBI's deadly force policy. Use of deadly force is what? Isn't that the ultimate seizure? They don't shoot to kill, but to eliminate the threat. Practicing with the firearm training system, a video simulator with scenarios and an air compression gun. In my case, I was entering a house with armed bank robbers. You can see my shadowy figure on the right. She pulled a gun and I shot back, but not before my partner took a hit. My shooting, not good, but my judgment was. Okay, shot it dry, Paula. Lucky for us in the academy, no casualties. All just exercises to help us see the dangerous side of the job. Now, it may look like just a lot of fun, but I learned a lot during the 10-week Citizens Academy. There's way more material than what we can fit into a story for broadcast, so I've added other insider information to my blog, A Wider Lens, on our website. Live in the studio, Paula Thornton, WAND News. With more than 40 railroad crossings indicator, you have probably been stuck behind a train. In fact, many of you on Facebook told us you've waited more than half an hour. Well, tonight our Paula Thornton investigates the trouble spots and the high cost to fix them. Decatur has a reputation. It's a railroad town. More than 200 miles of track crisscross Decatur meaning drivers get stuck waiting for the trains to pass. Sometimes you get blocked there for 10, 15, even 20 minutes sometimes. If you're running five minutes late to work and there's a freight, you're not happy. Frustrated, angry. Oh, I get impatient like anybody else. Mark Smith studies train and travel patterns in town. Because time is money. I asked him which crossings are blocked the most. We had issues, but we didn't know they were as significant as these are. At Brush College by Ferries Parkway, the worst, blocked more than 17 hours each week. Then it's El Dorado near Martin Luther King, blocked 15 hours a week. And Ferries Parkway near ADM, blocked nearly eight hours each week. That's entirely too long, they need to do something there. Smith is working on solutions. We went into this wanting win-win situations. How can we help their bottom line and help the community with regard to congestion. One answer, overpasses like these, but two of them built near ADM could have a price tag of $60 million. They're expensive, but it's expensive the way it is because of people's time, the travel, wear and tear. Over time, the buildup in that area, even with one overpass, would look like this. If nothing else changes, traffic blocked up, bumper to bumper. Yeah, that would Get out of your skin there. I think that's crazy. <laughs> what if there was an emergency? In the meantime, we just learned to drive around it. It's, it's a mixed blessing. You know, that's our bread and butter or soy milk. Though waiting for a train to pass can feel like an eternity, these symbols of commerce will keep rumbling through town. Smith and the URS design firm are continuing to study the most efficient solutions to the problem. Now, that's both for the companies and the people driving around. The results of that study should be out in the next couple of months. But of course, this is not a problem that can be solved just overnight. Don, back to you. Well, Paula, are there any laws to stop trains from blocking crossings for, you know, a certain long length of time? There actually used to be a law on the books that would stop trains from blocking crossings for 20 minutes. But back in 2008, the state Supreme Court actually struck that down. So now there aren't any limits at all. Interesting. All right, Paula, thanks. More details.